Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Stewart Observatory on this special Tuesday night edition of the Stewart Observatory Public Evening Lecture Series. Uh, before I introduce tonight's host, first of all, the telescope will not be open for viewing <laughs> at the conclusion of the presentation. I think you know why. All right. Uh, I also um, would like to thank, or would like to welcome those of you watching this podcast on the World Wide Web at www.as.arizona.edu and at uh, iTunes U. I have one extra announcement that I just want to bring to your attention. You know that Thebe Madupe couldn't make it next Monday. Professor George Riki, our, one of our region's professors, realized that the Spitzer Space Telescope is turning off next week. Yeah, and he thought it was fitting that he should give a, a requiem. So we will have a lecture. We just scheduled it today. There will be a, a lecture next Monday night. George Rieke will talk about the Spitzer Space Telescope, rest in peace. And then the Phi Beta Kappa lecture will be on Thursday the 31st. So we have two lectures for you next week. And hopefully you will uh, be able to attend them. Okay. So now, without further ado, I would like to, to, oh, I guess the reason this is a little bit different than most of our public evenings, this week the LSST um, uh, desk group has had, well, no, they, they say LSST. You can ask that question later, okay? The LSST <laughs> on dark energy is, is meeting this week here in Tucson, all right? So we have astronomers and physicists from all over the world uh, here this week, and they wanted to give, present a panel discussion. So the moderator, yes, the moderator of our panel discussion is Professor Eduardo Rosso from our own Department of Physics here at the University of Arizona. So I shall turn it over to Professor Rosso. Hi, everyone. Okay. So, so uh, I actually, I'm, I'm just going to say like two words because uh, our official moderator is going to be Eric Weiser. Um, but but uh, but the thing that I want to before I get uh, started, the thing that I want to say is uh, this: the, the the whole LSSD desk meeting, uh, which is the reason that we're all here uh, and we can host this event, uh, was was uh, co-sponsored by the Research Corporation for Science Advisement. Uh, so I just wanted to to give a really big shout out because without them we wouldn't have been able to do this. So thank you very much for our CSA. Okay, uh, and so so we have uh, we have a, a wonderful panel and we have a, a, a wonderful moderator. So it's Erica Weiser from uh, uh, Rutgers State University. Uh, he's a professor there. He got his degree from Berkeley. He received an NSF Career Award, and he's actually been the deputy director of the uh, LSSD Dark Energy Science Collaboration for the last two years, uh, and uh, he's going to be moderating for us. So thank you very much and welcome. Can everybody hear me all right? Yeah. Great. Thanks so much for coming out this evening. Thank you so much, Eduardo, for having us here. Uh, we're all cosmologists in the front of the room, which means we study the universe. And it's a really great pleasure for us to have a chance here to present to you our knowledge about the current state of the universe and some of the mysteries that we're encountering in our everyday research to try to share with you some of the exciting conversations that are going on this week while we're here at this meeting of the Dark Energy Science Collaboration. Before I say anything else, I want to introduce the esteemed panelists who are here before you tonight. The first we have here, Renee Logic. She's an assistant professor at the Dunlop Institute and the Department of Astronomy at the University of Toronto. Renee. <laughs> A lot of Toronto fans here tonight, clearly not about baseball, OK. She works on cosmology with a cosmic microwave background radiation and exploding stars called Type 1A supernovae. She received her doctorate in philosophy from Oxford as a South African Rhodes Scholar, and was recently named a Saifar Azraeli Global Scholar, and she's a TED Senior Fellow. In her spare time, Renee is a stand-up comedian. <laughs> I kid you not. And she was recently in a public debate with astronaut Chris Hadfield about whether or not we should allow human beings to explore space. 
So we'll look forward to hearing from Renee in a moment. Uh, next to her is Daniel Gruen. Uh, Daniel's recently been awarded a Panofsky Fellowship to build a cosmology group at the Stanford Linear Accelerator, National Accelerator Laboratory, and Stanford University. He co-leads the weak lensing, that's weak gravitational lensing working group of the Dark Energy Survey. And that's the group that's taken the largest and deepest image ever yet taken of our sky. And if the crisis of cosmology we'll talk about tonight escalates any further, Daniel's planning to switch to his side job as a lighthouse keeper on the Pacific Coast. <laughs> now, not to be confused with Daniel, sitting next to him is Dan. Everybody with me on that? We're going with Daniel and Dan tonight, even though Dan's given name would better match his compatriot. So Dan Skolnick is an assistant professor at Duke University and received his PhD from Johns Hopkins. And if we're applauding for Duke, I'm sure we're not talking about basketball. <laughs> he works in multiple collaborations, including one called the Shoes Team, which is at the center of this possible crisis we're talking about tonight. He recently was given the Packard Award for the nation's most promising early career scientists. And he got a supernova discovered by the Hubble Space Telescope to be named after his daughter. <laughs> you might also be wondering why we have a moderator tonight given these esteemed panelists and their ability to speak clearly to you. But there's a bad history at these kind of events. And so I had to pass a training course that involves both conflict resolution and first aid. But I'm confident that with those skills applied, we'll keep things calm and civil for you tonight. We wanted to offer just a bit of introduction to this subject of cosmology that we love so much. As we ask if cosmology is in crisis, and start with a brief history of our universe. So this is a diagram that we'd like to show. It is an artist's conception. We don't really know what happened back at the Big Bang, so we just have quantum fluctuations written there. That's when things were so hot and dense that our current laws of physics that we understand didn't apply. But something happened, some kind of quantum fluctuation, and from nothing there was something. And then there was a very rapid expansion of the universe, a period we call inflation that was characterized by an actual exponential growth in size of the universe. That's why this diagram expands outward so quickly at the beginning. As we move to the right, you see a nice color image. You're going to see another version of that tonight. That's what we can see from the cosmic microwave background radiation, the light released 400,000 years after the Big Bang. Then we actually had the cosmological dark ages, when there was no significant visible light in the universe, just that remnant from the original Big Bang. But the first stars formed about 400 million years after the Big Bang, started emitting light. And actually, right around that time, the first galaxies also formed. Over many billions of years, almost 14 billion years, galaxies evolved. The stellar explosions built up enough heavy elements to create planets. And somewhere along here, about halfway to the present, we had the formation of our solar system 4.6 billion years ago and the beginning of life on Earth within the first billion years after that. At the end of this, you'll notice that having sort of plateaued in its expansion, this cone flares out again. Unexpectedly, we discovered in 1998, through studies of these exploding stars called Type 1a supernovae, that the expansion of the universe, having slowed down a bit, actually started to increase again about 5 billion years ago. And that's this era that we're now in of accelerated expansion. And we write the words dark energy up there to say we can talk about a substance that's an energy filling every cubic foot of space that would cause that expansion to accelerate. That substance is consistent with Einstein's theory of general relativity. But we don't know why it's there or what it really is. And that's why we have something called the Dark Energy Science Collaboration meeting here this week whose primary science goal is to figure out what the heck is going on. That's a technical term. We have a standard model of the universe. We professionals call this lambda, the Greek letter, CDM, where lambda stands for the dark energy or cosmological constant, and CDM stands for cold dark matter. Remember I told you we don't really know what the dark energy is? 
Well, we don't really know what the dark matter is either. Okay, so this is the other great mystery that keeps us very busy at night at the telescope and during the daytime at our computers. What we know about this standard model is that our universe is 13.8 billion years old, give or take a tenth of a billion year. We know that a lot better. Back when I was in graduate school, we thought it was between 10 and 20 billion years old. So we've really narrowed things down a lot, and it's been a long time since I was in graduate school. We know something about the average curvature of the universe, that it appears to be flat. What we mean by that is that if you take a really big triangle and put it out in space, the sum of its angles would be 180 degrees. If you take two parallel lines, they would stay parallel forever as they go towards an unknown edge of the universe that might not even be there. Dark energy is 68% of the energy density of our universe. Dark matter, which we know must be there in some form because without extra mass causing gravity, the spiral galaxies are rotating too fast and their stars would fly off. And other galaxies and clusters of galaxies would also fly apart if we didn't have dark matter there, that is mass that doesn't give off light. The dark matter is 27% of the energy density of the universe. Baryons, which is a physicist's words for regular stuff, protons, neutrons, and electrons that you and I are made out of are only 5% of the energy in our universe. And so here's a perhaps more visual way to describe that, what the universe is currently made of. That's 68% dark energy, about 27% dark matter, and the other 5% is the regular stuff. You'll notice in the red color, the regular stuff is actually mostly hydrogen and helium gas floating around within and between galaxies. And it's only this very small 1% that's expanded out into this other pie chart here that is relevant to forming planets and life. The stars are a half percent. Neutrinos, which are passing through our bodies every second in great number and just not interacting, are almost the same amount. And then heavy elements, which means anything heavier than helium, basically carbon, and oxygen that we need to form terrestrial planets like Earth and life as we know it are 0.03% of the energy in our universe. And I'm talking about massive things as energy because there's an equivalence between mass and energy that Einstein taught us about, E equals mc squared, that you may have heard of. Okay, now I really like this pie chart because I think it shows us what the material in the universe really looks like and how much of it there is. And academics are famous for thinking that everything should be about their own personal research. That we should just take all of the graduate student labor and all of the grant money directed to what I study. And even though every academic thinks that, it doesn't make much sense. Well, the four of us up here are all cosmologists studying dark matter and dark energy. And we don't think that 100% of the grant money should be directed to what we study. We think it should only be the 70 plus 25, 95% <laughs> that the dark matter and dark energy comprise is important to keep things in proportion. I also really like this pie chart because I've never before seen Pac-Man eating a pie chart. <laughs> okay, so as you heard, the group meeting here this week that brought all four of us here, and that Eduardo is extremely active in as well, is the Legacy Survey for Space and Time, LSST has a new acronym, Dark Energy Science Collaboration which will use the newly named National Science Foundation Vera C. Rubin Observatory to discover billions of galaxies over a 10-year period starting two years from now. And this week we have roughly 200 scientists from about 20 countries attending the collaboration meeting here at the University of Arizona. We greatly appreciate your hospitality in having us. And I should mention that our collaboration is ably led by Rachel Mandelbaum, our spokesperson, who's from Carnegie Mellon. If you're interested in checking out more, our website is listed there. And the last thing I want to show you here is just a very schematic diagram of how it is that we go about learning about this dark matter and dark energy in our universe, trying to survey its constituents. In this direction, we talk about how sensitive to the expansion rate of the universe a given scientific experiment is. And in the vertical direction, we talk about how sensitive to the growth of the clumps of the universe, what we call structure growth basically how much the galaxies clump together and how much clusters of galaxies clump together. So that's increasing towards the top. We're going to hear today about supernovae from
Professor Dan Skolnick. We're going to hear about the cosmic wave background from Professor Renee Schlagic. And we're going to hear about gravitational lensing from our colleague Daniel Gruen. And I'd like to have each of them come up in turn, starting with Dan, to give you a sense of how it is that we do this in reality. All right. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Uh, so I'm going to give a very brief uh, introduction to the use of supernovae to measure the expansion of the universe. Okay. Can everyone hear me better? All right. Uh, so the, 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 one of the hardest things to do in cosmology is just to measure distances accurately. And uh, for supernovae, we, we use them as what we call standard candles. It's basically this idea that if you knew that the lights that you saw kind of all were the same light bulbs, had the same wattage, had the same everything about them, and you looked and you saw one light looked fainter than another light, you could tell how much further away that light is than the light nearby to you. We use the same idea for supernovae because these supernovae are special kinds of exploding stars that explode in roughly the same way every time. So if you're seeing one uh, look more bright than the other, you could tell how much further away it is than the other one. So from lots of different samples, uh, trying to look as far back into the universe as we possibly can, we, we collect these samples and we measure kind of the relative brightness. So on the right here, I'm showing basically this is the, the distance. And we, we compare that to how, how fast it seems like the, the galaxies that host these supernovae, how fast they're moving away from us. What, what's kind of the stretch of the universe at, at that time? And kind of the best fit line is our best model of the universe. Now, to, to measure the current expansion rate of the universe, uh, we, we do what's called the distance ladder. And really what we do is we take advantage of another standard candle called Cepheids. And Cepheids basically allow us to calibrate distances of galaxies more nearby to us. So it's three steps, this distance ladder. In the first step, we basically want to we want to put some scale of the universe. We want to say, how do we know how far away anything is, is in the universe? We say, well, one thing we know very well is we know the distance between the Earth and the Sun, and because we know that distance, and we could look at the positions of galaxies uh, that are uh, far away, and we wait uh, and we wait for the Earth to go all the way to the other side of the Sun. We say, how much has has these cepheids in these galaxies? seem to move because we've moved our position. It's not that these galaxies are moving, it's just that we've moved our position. And if we could look at how much uh, the angles have changed, then you can figure out how far away those galaxies are. And that allows us to calibrate the luminosity of the Cepheids. So in, in step one, we're calibrating the luminosity of the Cepheids. Then we say, okay, now let's find galaxies that have both these Cepheids and these supernovae, both of these standard candles. And you say, because we know the luminosity of these Cepheids, now we can calibrate the luminosity of the supernovae because they're in the same galaxy. They have to have the same distance. Then you say, all right, now I want to look at and really measure how the universe is expanding. Look, look out far enough that you could measure an expansion rate. And you say, now that you've measured the luminosity of supernovae, and you could look at how, how the difference in the brightness of the supernovae, the further out you look, that tells you the expansion rate. And that gives you a, the, what we call the Hubble constant, which is the current expansion rate of the universe. So now I'll hand it over to Renee to talk about the flip side of this. So one of the most important things that you'll hear from all of us is that we use observations of light to tell us something about distant uh, times in the universe and the conditions of those times in the universe. I have moved to Toronto and I ride the Toronto um, subway a lot. And one of the strangest and weirdest experiences is when you sit on the subway, you know someone was there about five minutes ago because the seat is weirdly warm. Now imagine we do that about the universe. So I study the cosmic microwave background, which is leftover light from a hot time in the universe. That light has been traveling to us for over 13 and a half billion years. And if we measure the light, and in fact we measure the temperature of the light, we can learn something about what the physical conditions were like in the beginning of the universe. We also measure something about how the universe has changed with time 
because it gives us this understanding of the expansion of the universe with time. So this is an artist's rendition of what we think the early universe looked like. It was mainly a smooth soup of um, protons and electrons, but the small differences in temperature on the sky tell us something about the physics of those early times. And in fact, uh, when I say we measure it on the sky, um, there's a little uh, movie here, which I'll talk over. What we actually do, and this is, um, this is true of all observations in astronomy, it, we, we're looking out of the sky, we project um, sort of a longitude and latitude coordinate system on the sky. Because we're astronomers, we decide to give it a fancy name and we call it right ascension and declination, but it's just the same as longitude and latitude in the sky. And then we can sort of unwrap that to make like a map of the universe as we see it from, uh, from Earth, just like you would make a map of the, of the Earth, we're making a map of the sky. And we measure this, the sky in different wavelength bands of light. Because we know that different physics gives you different wavelengths of light, we can learn something about different times in the universe and different physical processes. And in fact, uh, the cosmic microwave background, it's in the name, it's, uh, we measure that in the microwave part of the, um, of the spectrum of light. So we have to build incredibly um, cool detectors to measure this very faint light. And if we do that, we can learn something not only about what the universe was like early on, but how it's changed in time. Um, and this allows us to, to have a completely different picture of a different time. We call it early times rather than uh, the late times that uh, Dan told us about. We, uh, we can also really build up an incredible picture. So the, the, this light in the, uh, in the sky from the cosmic microwave background um, we notice that if we look at different parts in the sky, some parts are just a little bit warmer than the average, and some parts are a little bit colder than the average. And, uh, and the hot and cold spots, as they are called, actually tells us something fundamental about the physics of the universe. In fact, we can just go to the hot spots and the cold spots, and we can um, cut a patch around each hot spot and just add them together, and instead of just seeing random uh, spots, we build up this incredible picture where you can really see a, a, a pattern and a shape in the distribution of these spots. And that tells us something about physics of a light and physics of matter, and it tells us all about uh, what the universe contains. And if we know what it contains, we know how it changes with time. And that's going to be fundamental if we're to understand um, the age of the universe and all of that 95% um, that I'm taking grant money to, to work on. Okay. Okay, so um, what does the CMB tell us about the age of the universe? You can tell we're going to have, we're getting ready for the fisticuffs. So we're going to do this last part together because we're getting into the tension. All right, so the, the, the analogy that, that I like to give is, so I have a daughter, two daughters, we're, we're, I'm always going to the doctor's office, and I'm kind of mesmerized by these charts. So you, you know, everyone should, should recognize this. And... Basically, kind of what Renee has talked about is that we have this picture of the universe kind of as a baby from the cosmic microwave background. And what my team does is we measure basically the, the size of the universe today. Now, uh, if, if our model works, basically what you should be able to do is you should be able to say, here's how big the universe was as a baby. Now let's put you know, the baby on the curve just like you do with your kids at the doctor's office. And you should be able to trace it all the way and say, here's how big the universe should be today. And it's same idea. The problem is when we do that, basically, if our prediction should be up there for height, we're measuring something down there. Basically, we're, 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 we're measuring something off from what we see. So the, the scale of the universe that we measure is off from the scale of the universe that's predicted. And basically, the question is, you know, did, do we mess up here, or do we mess up in the middle, or do we mess up at the end? And that's the question. So... Um because it's difficult to, we don't have this lovely graph in, uh, in reality, right? As Dan said, we make different measurements. One way that we sort of quantify that is, is we say, if I estimate the age of the universe, or the inverse of the age of the universe, if we measure a parameter, I measure it with the CMB, I measure it with the supernovae, do those numbers agree? And the tension, dun, 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 is that they don't. Okay, so this is a, uh, it's a, it's a graph it's a, a bunch of different values. The thing you need to take from here is if everything agreed, all of these dots would be in a straight line. Okay. 
I mean, it sounds, it's, it's put in this, in this way to make it really easy to see the tension. And what we notice is that if we measure the baby universe, the age of the baby universe, or the age that is predicted by the CMB, you get those two little um, error bars at the top, um, and those near the box that says early. And so if I do my CMB measurements, I can infer H0, or you can think of that as a proxy for the age, and I get a certain value. Then we come down and we do what Dan has described, where we measure the age according to supernovae, according to late observations, or, or when your kid is already uh, at the doctor as a five-year-old or whatever, and we see a very different age. Now, if the universe uh, is in agreement, they have to agree. The question is, what do we do? That's why we're here. Um, but we're going, to, we're going to talk a little bit more about how we can try and understand the tension in those measurements and, and hopefully bring them together. And I'm going to hand over to Daniel. All right. Great. Thanks a lot, Dan and Renee. So, so you heard this, uh, this very good comparison here of the universe to a person. You heard Renee talk about this exquisite baby picture of the universe that we've taken and how she can predict the size and the growth of that person based on the baby, baby picture and then how Dan looks at the grown-up person and asks, well, does that actually match what, what, what has happened? Now, that's clearly a very important and fundamental property of the universe, its size. And it's, it's clearly a very fundamental, important property of human, but it's also it's a fairly simple thing, right? It's a fairly simple thing to predict. Maybe you need, you know, how much food, you know, how tall are the parents, you know, how much human growth hormone, whatever. And then, then you can make a pretty good prediction, pretty simple model, pretty good prediction. But there's actually more to that picture that we can take. Because in that picture, that baby picture, you, you know, you not just measure the size of the universe, but you also measure the seas of structure, right? You measure these fluctuations of the temperature. They're tiny, uh, but, but they're there in that very early baby picture of the universe. Just imagine you had to build an understanding of the, the human being, or you had to build an understanding of the universe that allowed you to take that baby picture, close your eyes for you know, the lifetime of that person, and predict what it would look like uh, later. And so that's, that's what we're trying to do in Lambda CDM. Here's a picture of what we think structure in the universe looks like today, growing from these initial fluctuations in the baby picture by many orders of magnitude, not just in size, but also in these amplitudes of matter density fluctuations. Clusters of galaxies, galaxies, all that needs to form, and we're trying to test whether our theory is correctly predicting that. Now, we would love to do that directly by looking at you know, where all the matter is. But we can only do that in a simulation. This, is, this picture is from simulating that growth of structure in the universe. In reality, we can't see directly where the matter is. The only thing we can see looks something like this. So this is a picture that we've taken with the Dark Energy Survey. Uh, it's the sort of image quality and depth that we will get from LSST over you know, a large part of the sky we can only do that by staring for many, many hours on end at the same place on the sky with our smaller telescope. But what you see here, every little dot is a galaxy, right? And it's some, you know, we need to learn from where these galaxies are and how these galaxies look about the structure of matter density. What's the underlying structure of that universe? And so a really important tool to do that is gravitational lensing. And it's, it's really quite simple. When you have a massive structure, like you know, here there's, a, say there's a, a lot of material in a cluster of galaxies, and you have a galaxy right behind that, the path of its light to us is going to be affected by the gravity of that structure. Uh, and so one thing that is going to happen because of that is we're not going to see that galaxy in the background like this roundish thing here. Instead, we're going to see it in a distorted shape, like a banana that's aligned around that foreground structure. And the, so that's, that effect is what we call weak gravitational lensing, gravitational shear. And so that's the key connection. This is how we can learn from just taking images about what is going on with the matter density of the universe uh, that's sort of behind those galaxies. Uh, it's, our, it's our most direct way of seeing those. And so when we do that, 
uh, you know, that we, we find something, uh, we find something interesting, right? So we take a picture uh, with weak gravitational lensing of the fluctuations of density in the universe today, right? How clumpy is this picture? Could be very uniform or it could be really clumpy with, you know, one part containing all the matter and the other part being completely empty. And so we parameterize that, we give it, we have a parameter here that uh, describes how clumpy this grown-up universe is. And so you see a couple of colorful data points. These are different experiments, all using gravitational lensing in, in different ways, run by different teams over the past six to ten years maybe. Yeah? And they get slightly different numbers, but within the uncertainties of those numbers, broadly, they seem to agree that, you know, things are somewhere around here. And then we can go back to Renee's picture of that baby universe and predict, given that baby picture and the laws that we think are correct, what the amplitude of structure, what the clumpiness of the universe should be today. And we get this orange bar here. Okay. And so what a lot of us are starting to think when they look at that plot is that it's kind of weird that all the colorful data points are to the left of that orange bar. Uh, not, you know, not one of them individually with particularly high significance, but it is strange that we have ordered 10 measurements now and they, they all tend to lie low. They all tend to say the universe is a little less clumpy than you would have predicted if you had just looked at Renee's baby picture and the Lambda CDM model of the universe. So this is where we're, this is where we're kind of uh, stuck at the moment. Okay, th thanks for giving us your attention while we outline the situation for you. Now we'll move into a proper discussion panel mode for you here with our experts to my left. And what I want to do is hold their feet to the fire. So you've showed us two diagrams, one of which is still on screen, of what we call tension between different measurements. Tension's all right. Tension might make you want to design a new experiment or recheck your analysis. But is cosmology in crisis? So, here we go. I'm ready. <clears throat> so I, I just want to uh, defend my baby picture for a second. <laughs> because you've heard two different tensions. You've heard a tension between my baby picture and Dan's slightly more grown-up picture. And you've heard a tension between Daniel's clumpiness and my clumpiness. So some of you may be thinking the problem is me, okay? <laughs> and I just, I gotta defend myself. So here's, here's why that isn't, it can't be the whole argument. The picture that we make of the baby universe, my baby picture, we think that the, the physics is some of the physics we understand the best. So the picture that we take of this early universe is when physics was a little bit more simple. So if, if you just throw stones at me and you say it must be this early universe, this cosmic microwave background, well, that's the stuff we know the best. So that doesn't necessarily solve the problem. It doesn't mean it goes away, but, but when we talk about this tension, if we could just say, oh, the cosmic microwave background is wrong, we'll all go to lunch, um, that gives us more problems sometimes than it fixes. The other thing I should say is that the reason why this tension is interesting is because taking this baby picture, making the measurement, is very hard because we have to measure this light from very far away. And so typically, we have a lot of different experiments that are doing that. Um, you might have heard of the Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy Probe. We like acronyms. It's called WMAP. And you might have heard of the Planck satellite. Those were two independent satellites uh, that were operating decades apart, measuring this light and, and improving in the measurement every time. And up until now, those measurements agree. So different people who take a picture of the baby universe, they all agree. So we can't even necessarily say it's one experiment that's wrong. So the tension, I wouldn't say it's necessarily a crisis, 
but, but the, the reason why we're all uncomfortable is you can't easily point your finger at any one of us and say, you're clearly the one that has made a mistake. Um, so so it's, it's not my fault. Just, just on one point that, that you made, I, I actually would t have a different take on you know, your early picture being fully understood and so simple. Because there's, there's an important way in, uh, in, in which maybe it isn't. Uh, and, and that's because small things that were missing could influence that picture a lot. Right? So the thing that you must know is that in the early universe, because the universe was so much smaller, the densities and the temperatures were much higher than they are today. So if there's any physics, if there's any new particles that only play a role under these high densities and high pressures that maybe we can't even create in the lab today, uh, maybe that would change, that would have to change our interpretation of the picture that we're taking. I, 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 I am absolutely impressed by the quality and the beauty of the picture that you're taking. But what I'm saying is, even if we're just missing a small ingredient, maybe that actually changes how that whole universe is going to evolve, right? And, and how we should interpret that picture that we're taking. Yeah, so I want to take the position that absolutely cosmology is in crisis. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think what I don't know is if it's a fun crisis or a really sad crisis. Uh, so let me explain. So, when Eric showed the pie chart, he shows there's, there's dark energy and there's dark matter, and that makes up 95% of the universe. Now, we don't know what either dark energy or dark matter are. Right? We, we don't understand 95%. So status quo right now is we kind of feel good about 5%. I mean, that, so that, 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 that's a crisis, I think. Now, if it turns out that we're all doing the right thing here, and there really is kind of some new physics, and we're, we're chasing it right now, we have these hints, Right, that to me is a really fun crisis. So I hope that we're doing the right thing, and I hope we're in kind of the fun land, and it's not that this is going to go away, and then we're just stuck with 95% of the universe being totally confusing to us. Uh, so it, it's a crisis one way or the other. It's just how much we're going to enjoy it at this point, I think. <laughs> All right, so now I'd like you to take the opposite argument, Dan. That, that we're not in crisis? No, no, Dan. Yeah, yeah, yeah tell us why it's not a crisis. Uh, okay, it's not, a <laughs> it's not a crisis because maybe there are people like the three of us that just have a bunch of sign errors and we screwed up majorly in some way. And there's some kind of conspiracy going on where Daniel made some mistake and I made some mistake or Renee made some mistake and it makes it seem like there's all this, these interesting things going on. But in the end of the day, there are people behind it. And... Uh, you know, we are aggressive with how well we think we did, and we actually messed up. This is what keeps me up at night, so I may as well be revealing about it. Yeah, go ahead. Daniel. So, I mean, th there's always this dual nature to a crisis, and it's not just true in science, it's true in life as well, that, you know, it's an opportunity and risk. Something happens in your life that doesn't match your expectations. Something didn't work the way you thought it, it would. There's an opportunity for you to learn from that, something fundamental about life and, and work on yourself. And there's also a chance that you're gonna realize the thing you did for the past 10 years, it was absolutely not worth it, right? <laughs> so I think it could go either way. Uh, and and uh, you know, that's why we're all a little anxious. That's why I'm sitting between these two people to keep them from you know, physically fighting with one another. Right? It, it, it could well be, and we're, we're heavily working on finding out and making sure we're not doing that, that we're fooling ourselves in, in some of these measurements or in some of these interpretations. And so that's why we're worried, right? The crisis isn't so much that they're disagreeing. It's great that they're disagreeing. That's how we could learn. The crisis is that maybe that disagreement isn't real, right? So that's the thing that we're, I think, afraid of. Yeah, so I would love, I would love as Dan said, to live in the crisis where there's some exotic new physics that is the reason for the differences. And, and it's something that doesn't switch on when the universe is a baby, but does switch on later and really switches on by the time the universe is old and Dan is making his measurements. The problem with that is, <clears throat> have you ever found out that your friends threw a party and you didn't get invited? <laughs> and you think to yourself, well, it could be that they lost my phone number or it could be that, um, their car broke down and they were going to pick me up or it was a surprise party. All of those um, explanations, while they are comforting, these are the new physics things I'm talking about, often the explanation is they just don't like you. 
And my worry is that the, the truth is just we made a mistake. All of us, in some ways, made a mistake in our observations. And, 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 and I'm, getting, I'm getting old and I'm getting not invited to parties more and more. And I worry that, that the, the exotic physics idea, it keeps us up at night and it's exciting, but experience has shown me that it's much more likely that I made some mistake, even, even if it's three mistakes in different ways. Um, and so whenever I read a paper saying there must be some exotic new physics, every time we test that, we test a new physics and we say, does it resolve these, these problems? It doesn't quite resolve it. So we haven't found an exotic type of physics that manages to solve all of them at the same time. Sometimes it'll help with the, the problem with me and Daniel. Sometimes it'll help with the problem with me and Dan. But when you put all the data together, none of the exotic physics we've come up with is, is simple enough and good enough to solve the problem. So Occam's razor makes me worried. <laughs> Just because I, I never heard this uh, party analogy before. Um, <laughs> So I agree the worry is like maybe it's us, maybe they just don't like us. I think what's been really exciting over the last six months to a year is that there have been kind of more people coming to this party and they're all kind of agreeing with the same story. So it, it's, it's, it's not, I think maybe I've lost this analogy at this point, but it's not, it's not seeming like one person as much anymore. There's now kind of now more and more independent checks and starting to see like, Something else is going on. And, uh, and that's been the new thing over the, over the last few months. OK. What I would like you all to do now is take your crystal ball. Mm -hmm. uh, crystal ball might not sound particularly scientific, <laughs> but it turns out that we have little pieces of diamond that we use. We just keep them in our pocket. And we take all of the romance out of them by calling them high pressure carbon. <laughs> so can you take your little diamond and? prognosticate the future when the large, when the legacy survey of space and time has been run with the Vera Rubin Observatory, roughly 10 years from now when we've got papers out, will we be looking at the same kind of plots or will things be totally different? Okay, so I'm going to half punt, but I think the survey that we get out of the Rubin Observatory LSST, is going to give us fantastic measurements of distances and lensing. It isn't, of course, going to make a new measurement of the baby universe, because this is a telescope that's measuring galaxies at late time. So it's going to help a lot between Daniel and Dan. Um, the good thing is that there are, we are building other telescopes to go after the baby picture in new ways. And what I'm going to challenge the community to do is rather than getting the data and sitting back and saying, how can I make it fit? I want us now to say, let me pick my favorite solution. Dan likes this some new exotic physics. Let me make a prediction for what LSST will see and what the new um, observatories of the, the cosmic microwave background. So one of them is called the Simons Observatory. Make a prediction for what they must see and we must see with LSST and then put it in an envelope and we'll see in five years' time, uh, you know, not who was right, but how we resolved it. Um, because my worry is that otherwise we'll always, we, we're never really looking into the crystal ball. We're always hedging based on prior data. So I think we'll be closer to figuring it out. Um, I... Mm, I think it's, yeah, I don't think it's exciting physics. I mean, I think it's exciting physics, but I don't think it's exciting physics we have not yet thought of. Um, I think we're going to uh, figure out the systematic that is affecting all of our measurements. So I'm going to make a very conservative prediction, and then I'm going to go out on a limb. Okay. So the conservative prediction is that we're going to stay anxious and worried about having missed something, having done something wrong in our measurements. Because that's, that's kind of the foundation, actually, of science. That's what you've got to do. You've got to keep questioning yourself and your measurements and your model. That's a very simple prediction. The other simple prediction is that there is clearly, absolutely, definitely, physics out there that we don't understand. Right? So dark matter, dark energy, we're 100% sure that their effects are present in the universe, and we cannot in any way 
explain them with our current standard model of physics. So there is something there to discover, absolutely certain. Now the question is, can we or can we not discover that? Are or are, the, are, or are these signs not? These discrepancies that we're finding currently, are they not um, pointing us at what that is? And so my going out on a limb is that I am very hopeful that they are. I'm hopeful that, you know, maybe it's not going to tell us the whole story, but it's going to point us into a corner of model space, at least, where we can say it, it's got to be something like this. And if we build this next new experiment, we're going to find out exactly. And, you know, that would be a, a triumph, much like the discovery of the Higgs particle. Uh, and, you know, we'll see uh, in 10, 20, 30 years time. Yeah, I, I like a lot what Daniel just said. Uh, I, I am, you know, hopeful for something. I think what, what's kind of interesting about the Hubble constant tension is like it's kind of kind of become one of like the big things in cosmology. It's taken on a bit of like a, a broader symbolism of this question of like, are there still surprises in cosmology left? And to me, it just seems su su surprising that given how much we don't know about the universe, that we really just have it all right now. And yeah, we're gonna, all going to worry about us messing up. But I just like, the, the history of science has always been people saying, in just two more years, we're going to have it all settled, and then there's some revolution. I mean, that, that you look back however far you want, same thing keeps happening. I don't know why this time should be different. Uh, I don't think we're that special. I think there's some surprise coming. So the, I just want to give a little bit of, I realized um, we're talking about new physics, but we sort of, we're dancing around what it might be. And I wanted to um, clearly state why it's hard. Okay, so if we measure a universe in the CMB with my beautiful baby picture, that's definitely not wrong. Um, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> if we measure in this, the CMB, we measure a universe that appears to be, um, have a Hubble constant, or which you can think of as a proxy for the age. It's kind of like one over the age. Uh, if we measure the Hubble constant at being 65, okay? And then we measure at late times, uh, Dan makes a measurement that's more like, more like 75, okay? And the error bars are very small. What we need to have happened is the universe went through this little spurt of strange acceleration and then settled down to something much more common. But when we say much more common, that model is still very strange. There's a lot in our standard picture. You saw 95% of it we still don't understand. But now the additional physics is you want to add another bump of something a little bit more weird and have it only kick on when the universe was really young and then stop and then settle down to something uh, slightly less strange. So my worry is that just as we added epicycles, early on in the lifetime of, of human understanding of our place in the cosmos because we didn't understand the orbits of planets, if I worry that we get, we, if the temptation might be as theorists of cosmology to add epicycles, slightly more complicated model of the universe and complicated and complicated because our data don't agree. Now that's a challenge. The challenge is can you come up with a beautiful, as simple as you can model that also has new physics. And, and that's my worry, is that we'll come up with so a solution that will look like a bunch of you know, tape and just holding everything together. And then I'll, I may have a solution to the h null problem, but I'm gonna cry because that's the ugly universe I live in, as opposed to a beautiful universe I live in that I don't understand. Okay, and thank you, Renee. I, I wanted to offer a slightly different perspective. Dan mentioned history. And if we look at the diagrams in front of you, so this one, we're seeing disagreements. You can see from these horizontal bars that we call error bars that individually there's some disagreement. There's one light blue point that's in pretty bad disagreement with our expectation. Otherwise, it's not so bad. Formally, that's tension. Formally, that's a disagreement. And maybe you could call it a crisis. I'd prefer Renee's phrasing of not necessarily a crisis. That was really going right down the middle. No chance of getting it wrong there, huh, Renee? All right. But if you look at the earlier diagram we showed you, the numbers we were comparing there were 67 and 73 for this rate of how fast the universe is expanding. 
And the reason that's tension is because the 67 experiment says it can't be above 68. And the 73 experiment says it can't be below 70. OK, so disagreement, tension, possibly a crisis. Now, with this rate at which the universe is expanding, what were people saying 20 years ago? One team was saying it's 80, and it can't be below 75. And another was saying it's 60, and it can't be above 65. Same kind of argument of the expanse of the universe. Well, 65 is sort of OK, but 60 is wrong compared to the current observations, and 80 is wrong. So why were both teams wrong then? What we call systematic errors. We've learned a lot about astronomy, about how the universe works. Since then, that's led us to the current values. If you go 20 years earlier, the numbers were 50 and 100. They were having knockdown, drag out fights at conferences that really did need conflict mediation between numbers that we think are preposterous nowadays. So the lesson I see in all of this is we're very bad at fully understanding the challenges that the universe throws at us in galaxies, in stars. And we often underestimate how broad those error bars should be. It seems pretty likely that's still happening. But it could be that these are still the first hints of something new and exciting that will be, as Rene mentioned, the next revolution in science. I think we couldn't responsibly tell you tonight that there's a new revolution coming. But it does seem advantageous to call it a crisis, because as Daniel mentioned, there's a managerial style that says, never let a good crisis go to waste. <laughs> and so we want to put this for you all tonight. We've tried to, in the most interesting context we can, to try to explain things without exaggerating. But to pique your interest, I really appreciate you all coming out. What we'd like to do now is take your questions. Sir in the back. How about one? We can come back to you later. That's a really great question. So just um, to repeat, because I have a microphone, you know, why bother with the baby picture at all? Uh, why not just concentrate on the on the physics that we, are, you know, at later times? Um, and it again kind of goes back to the the point that so, um, you know, gravity makes everything more extreme. So if you're if you're a clumpy thing in the universe, you get clumpier under gravity. Um, but understanding the way that process uh, um, behaves is quite complicated, and in fact. We say that it's non-linear because it's, it's, very, um, it's a very complicated process. If we look at the baby picture of the universe, it's actually a lot simpler. The physics is a lot simpler. So taking that picture gives us a really good starting point. Um, and, uh, and then we can take that forward. If we only looked at the picture today, we wouldn't know if the stuff we're seeing, is that because of interactions with a, a galaxy, or is it actually due to the baby, baby's inherent nature, the universe's inherent nature? If we only have one picture late, at late times, then we have even more confusion and things to disentangle. So the baby picture tells us a really good starting point, and if I had my way, it would predict everything um, uh, correctly, but it doesn't. Sir. So two, two very good questions that, you know, of course we're worried about and thinking a lot about all the time. So the first question was, how do we know our extrapolation? That is our model for how the universe works, uh, that we're calculating that correctly. Right, so one, one way that we could find something interesting is maybe the model is wrong. Maybe it's, there's a new component that we missed to put in our model, and that'd be interesting to physics. One other thing that could happen is we're doing the calculation wrong. We got, you know, we got the maths wrong, and the model is in fact correct. So that's the thing that we need to you know, make sure as scientists we're not doing. So we're double checking our calculations numerically, you know, running simulations with computers, uh, and, and making these calculations with sort of pen and paper, and making sure that we understand what's going on and that our predictions for these observables are very, very accurate. 
you know, they're, they're very, very close to what really should be happening if the universe is indeed governed by those laws. And then the second question you had is, you know, why is it clumpiness that we should be measuring? You know, why, why don't, you know, what else could there be? And so this was a very, you're, you're, you're absolutely right, right? So, so this one number to describe how much structure there is in the universe that I'm calling clumpiness is an extremely oversimplified way of describing structure in the universe, right? So you and I in this room, and it, it connects to the question that we just had. We, you know, our, our existence is probably telling us a lot about the laws of physics, you know, the fact that we can be here and uh, have this conversation and our atoms aren't falling apart, right, and so on. But the first thing you do is this, this simple amplitude of structure, and then maybe you could go, as you get better at making predictions and calculations, you can go into more complicated properties of the universe that you can test. But there, really, your first question comes into play. Yeah. Are we able to predict these accurately? Uh, and that's, you know, that's what we will also be working on. How about all the way in the back, blue shirt? Right, hmm. right, great question. So yeah, the question is, um, is the Hubble constant not really a constant? Um, and like, does that fall under some epicyclic thing? So the Hubble constant is a really terrible name uh, because it, it is not a constant. Uh, basically, the number that we measure, that we call the Hubble constant, is what is today's expansion rate of the universe. And the, the Hubble constant, if we measured this a million years ago, a billion years ago, would be a different number. It's just kind of given constant named after Hubble as like a important number. So it is changing, uh, and we, we can model how it should be changing, uh, but, but it, it itself is more just a very important number. Um, how about sir, dark blue shirt. Um, yes, yeah, so we, um, oh, the question, yes, the question was, what if there are not just four interactions or, or kind of four fundamental forces? What if the physics is some other interaction in the universe that's causing this? So, um, we, uh, I should say, you know, our bias or our, um, approach is, uh, always focused on um, using data to test theoretical models. Now, each of us are interested in different kinds of theoretical models, and some of those models include uh, additional interactions. So one of the things we know the least about is, is dark matter. And you can ask, we, we typically, um, Eric was talking about cold dark matter. Uh, we assume it doesn't interact. But you could say, what if the dark matter actually interacts with itself? And, and we creatively call it self-interacting dark matter um, because we're very good at naming things um, and so you could say well what if there was some self-interacting dark matter now one of the main things that we do as cosmologists is we say you give me a model that has a thing in it self-interacting dark matter or some additional force maybe some fifth force and I uh, we then go and predict what are the observable consequences of this what what do the supernova look like what does the baby picture look like what does the weak lensing look like and then we run it through our data and we do kind of matching of model to data and if those don't match we go bad idea try a different idea so we are very open to all of these different kinds of models and in fact you know when I talked about um, epicycles uh, turns out self interacting dark matter doesn't quite work um, Additional forces doesn't quite work. Changing gravity doesn't quite work. So we're actually trying all of these ones and they're getting more and more complicated and they, none of them quite work. But we're very open and, and hopefully, if we do come up with a theoretical solution rather than just a, a data-driven one, it will be some new theory that some person has thought of that gives the right predictions for the observables that we see.
So, so, so there is a formal definition. Uh, that's one thing, and then th there's a question how, you know, what's a good definition? The definition we use is just if I take some large volume of space, mm. 8 megaparsecs radius, and I, I put it in different places in the universe and I measure the matter density, how much is that going to fluctuate from place to place? You know, just put an amplitude on those fluctuations, that's the thing we use, right? And so the, the second question is how do we measure that? Right, and, and gravitational lensing is one way of measuring that, checking how strongly pairs of galaxies are aligned when they are at a certain separation in the sky. If, if the universe is really clumpy, it's going to cause them to be very strongly aligned. If the universe is more or less homogeneous, it's going to not cause much of an alignment of those galaxies. So, so that's a very direct measure. You know, this, the strength of the alignment of shapes of galaxies due to the gravitational lensing of those density function is a very direct way of measuring that amplitude. Um, I should just say, we, we also, maybe this wasn't clear before, but one of the main things that we do as cosmologists is we do a lot of statistics. So just like when someone takes a census of you, they don't actually care about how your day is going. They care about, on average, um, how are you, you know, what is your age, where do you live, etc. So we don't care about individual galaxies or stars. Um, we care about, on average, what are the properties. And so when we talk about clumpiness, like Daniel just said, we're not talking about the clumpiness of each. I can't tell you what individual galaxies will do, but we, st we, con we compute the statistics of them to make these kinds of measurements. Um, okay, so there are a few parts of the question which I'll repeat. So the question was, uh, we've been talking about one universe, what if we lived in a multiverse? Um, you added in a qualifier as could some of the stuff have leaked out? I'm going to sort of get to that a little bit, but um, I should say, uh, again, we're open, just like we're open to self-interacting dark matter, we're open to new models. Um, so um, one uh, type of dark matter component or proponent is called the axion. It's something that I study. Um, and the axion can be thought of as a um, prediction of string theory, which is a higher dimensional theory. The um, extra dimensions are wound up really, really tight. And the axions essentially come from the winding up and the compactification of those extra dimensions. So axions are predicted by string theory. And I do the whole, what will the CMB look like if there are axions? What did the dark matter? Um, what does the clumpiness look like? And I make those predictions and I and I fit them. That's one version. So I'm open to theories of uh, that contain a multiverse as long as I can come up with a prediction for what I see. I'm not. Uh, it's it's very hard for me as someone who works with data to take a model that doesn't make predictions. So the the res, the set of uh, interesting multiverse models we care about are restricted to the ones that can make predictions for what I see. Um, in sp specifically to your question about if there's additional stuff leaking out, those are sometimes known as kind of brain models, um, and I don't study those, but there are people that try to make those predictions. So yeah, we really are open to uh, interesting models as long as they make predictions. Yeah, I, I would say there is. So the question is, you know, do these new components that we've introduced, dark matter, dark energy, do they match Einstein's picture, including the equivalence of, of matter and energy? And I think the answer is yes. Actually, one thing that's so attractive about this model, and it's kept us all, you know, uh, work, working on it and working on testing it, is because the kind of dark energy that so far matches most most observations, maybe except what we saw, is the only kind that you can easily just plug into Einstein's theory. So it's this constant 
matter, this constant energy density of the vacuum. So, so to some degree, right, um, I, I think the reason that people are hesitant to, to giving up the principles of this model are actually because when you do that, you're going to mess potentially with Einstein's theory of gravity. And if I can add one thing, it would be really satisfying if we had a theory that said there's one thing out there and it's both dark energy and dark matter. It kind of converts from one to the other. Nobody's come up with a theory like that that works yet. So we're really stuck with these separate substances of dark energy and dark matter, even though they both fit within general relativity, as Daniel was saying. How about all the way in the back? <laughs> no, I know. Uh, but I think uh, before we go back to the 1960. Yeah, so um, everyone's got to ask the gotcha question. Yeah, so um, uh, so one of the things that that we can do is, uh, I, I uh, okay. So I should say that we um, in in cosmology we distinguish between direct measurements and inferred measurements. Okay, so um, Dan's measurement is a direct measurement. He's measuring. The, the kind of age of the universe today and, and inferring um, and getting H0 from that. In terms of the CMB, uh, H0 is what we call a derived parameter. So we have six parameters that tell me everything I need to know about this baby picture. Um, the densities of stuff, dark matter, dark energy, and baryons like me and you. Um, a little bit about what how um, see-through the universe was at that time. And then one of the um, uh, parameters is the how the total energy of the universe, or H0. So when I run, the way I estimate these parameters is I take my theoretical model. I have a, a very simple code that predicts the CMB that I should see, the distribution on the sky, and then I match that to the data. And I do that iteratively, changing my model a little bit, so changing the, the how much of the universe is made up of dark matter, how much is made of dark energy. And I keep doing this like hundreds of thousands of times. And, and each, each time I take that step, or I take that new jump in model space, I match with my data. Um, and so at the end of it, I say, which values of H0 are preferred? And the, the, what H0 does is it changes the size of the universe or changes the distance to the cosmic microwave background. And if it changes the distance to the cosmic microwave background, it actually changes the size of the hot and cold spots on the sky. So if the universe is um, older or younger, the average size of those spots gets bigger and smaller. It's actually quite a profound and beautiful effect. So even though it's not a direct measurement of the age today, what it's doing is essentially moving the CMB closer to me or further away from me. And so those spots would change size. And that's why we actually get a pretty good error bar on the age, because what we really say is what we definitely know is the distance to the cosmic microwave background by the size of those spots. And that's how I, I infer the age. But, you but you're right, there's a difference between how I do it and how, how Dan does it and also how Daniel does it.
great, great question. So the question is, can we take a picture of the universe as a teenager? So yeah, so we, we kind of do that already. So with supernovae or with uh, barren acoustic oscillations, which we haven't really talked too much about, that kind of tells us the scale of the universe as a teenager. So we, we do have some pictures of the universe in the middle. And basically what those pictures show is that our model looks OK. Uh, so that kind of how the, our kid is growing is exactly in line with expectations. So kind of where people look for a resolution to this crisis is either something very early, kind of something that, that's happening to the universe as a baby, or very late, that something happened now. Because kind of everything in between, uh, puberty and whatever, that looked totally normal. I think broadly there is a consensus of what we should do and then there's there's maybe different theories that different people find more attractive for explaining these discrepancies that we're finding but you're pointing out an interesting fact here which is that science is very psychological and very sociological as well right so at what point are we going to have this panel and everybody's in the world really every expert in the world is going to agree that there is a discrepancy right it's it's a matter of personal threshold. You know, when are you going to say no? I, you know, I, I don't. And to me, maybe you heard that threshold. I, I've passed maybe most of that threshold over the past year or two, right, with these new results that we've had. Others maybe are not at that point. Uh, but there's there's definitely group effects as well. Of you know, when when is there a, a large enough number of scientists saying, look, there's clearly something wrong here, and then others are going to follow. So it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting um, yeah, group dynamic. Yeah, so I, I have noticed kind of one kind of break between certain groups. And some of this is like the subtext of some of Renee's comments about epicycles, which are like this old school uh, theoretical insult. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, so basically, uh, you know, there's, there's the observers, and you know, the observers see this kind of discrepancy. And I think there's kind of people who are more uh, on the theoretical side that kind of say, kind of like what Renee's saying, that there isn't a better, simpler, prettier model to describe what we're seeing than this model that we have. And while it's not satisfactory, you know, we, we don't know these things, it's simple and it's beautiful. And I think that there's a lot of people in our community that say they won't believe an experimental result until they have a good theory that explains it. And to me, that's kind of been the, uh, I don't know, the, the most interesting thing about trying to convince certain people is that we don't have a good theory, and a lot of people won't be convinced until there is one. So I should say that there are, the great thing about the, the, the field that we do, and in fact, the great thing about the fact that a lot of science is publicly funded, I just want to give a shout out to tax dollars going to science funding. Um, what that means, no, no, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm genuinely, uh, thank you. Um, the reason why that's so important is it means that data that's taken with something like um, the Planck satellite or the Hubble Space Telescope, that data is, we are required to make it publicly available. And what that means is someone can go and, and, and reanalyze that data. So maybe you, you think you understand the systematics a little bit better and you want to reanalyze the data. That's very healthy because it means we can check each other and we can uh, sort of have this, this balance between theory and data. I agree with Dan that there are some people that say, listen, until I have a good theory, I'm not going to believe any data. And I think that that's, that's short-sighted. Uh, we need to be pushed by the data and we need to be in, uh, kind of inspired by the theory. And there's always this back and forward. The thing that makes me, I'm very lucky, is that the universe is in no rush. <laughs> like, 
Like, we've, we have at least, you know, two or three billion years to figure this out. Um, but, you know, we are doing, I, I actually can't describe to you just how precise the measurements of, um, that we're going to make uh, with the Rubin Observatory are going to be. We are going to measure the surface of the telescope, of the mirror, to incredible precision. We're going to measure our filters to incredible precision. And that pushes on the theory because now the observations are, are getting more and more precise and that gives you less room to hide. And the less room you have to hide, the more these tensions become dramatic and the, and the more you really have to deal with them. And so we have to do, the, we have to do to, two things together. We can't just sit around and say, I'm not gonna come up with any new theories. And at the same time, we can't stop building telescopes just because we don't understand the theory yet because otherwise we'll be complacent. So it is very exciting that, that all of these things happen together. Great, and on that uplifting and insightful note, I think we should wrap up the discussion panel and I'll head it back over to Professor Rosso.